Welcome to this LeapFrog Geothermal Best Practice video. Today we are going to talk about structural modeling and in particular finite faults. My name is Bastian Pux. I am the technical sales advisor for Energy at Sequent. Please note that the objective of this video is to focus on the tools in LeapFrog Geothermal and to give you helpful workflow ideas and tips and tricks to elevate your modeling skills. The material covered in this video is meant to be high level and is using a simplified dataset. It is my pleasure to host you for this video. In the real world, faults are often complex features, terminating in space rather than providing a reasonable domain boundary. They are surrounded by networks of brittle and ductile damages rather than simple clear planes. When building a fault system, under your geological model in Leapfrog Geothermal, you can define the interactions between faults and their chronology to build a structural model. It will divide the geological model in a number of blocks separated by faults. In this video, we will explore a workflow to model a finite fault in LeapFrog Geothermal, meaning a fault that doesn't necessarily end against the model boundary or another fault. This workflow, is divided, this workflow is divided in two steps. First, we need to create the lithological surface and the fault offset. Secondly, we will need to clip the fault surface to give it the desired extent. This workflow should not be considered as the solution for all approaches to structural modeling. It will likely need to be adapted depending on your projects and goals. We have now created a new project in LeapFrog Geothermal. As a reminder, you have on the left the project tree. In the middle, the 3D scene. Below the 3D scene is the shape list. At the bottom right corner is the property panel. And above the 3D scene, you have your toolbar. First, we are going to import a topography. By right-clicking on the topographies folder, select new topography, and import elevation grid. And we will select our DEM grid and open it. By default, the resolution is 100 meters. It is clipped to the boundary box, so we can import it and keep the name topography. You can drag it in the scene if you want to visualize it. Next, we're going to import the well data. By right-clicking on the well data folder, I'm going to select import wells. I have to select first the location file and I select the CSV file name location. Automatically LeapFrog recognizes the survey file and the geology file. I can now import them. In the location table, we can see the well ID, X, Y, and Z coordinates of the well head, and the max depth of the well. Next, we will see the survey table, which also have the well ID, the depth of the measurement, the dip, and the azimuth value. I can click Next, and finally, on the Geology table, I can see my Well ID from into interval and my lithologies. I can now click on Finish to import my wells. It is going to process the data for a few seconds. When it's done, you can select your Geology table and drag it into the 3D scene. We can see here the different wells. You can show them as 3D tubes by clicking in the button in the shape list. We can also add the legend, and we see that there are here two different lithologies. We can change the color by clicking on Edit Color. Select yellow for the sediments, maybe a lighter yellow. And we're going to leave the volcanics as red. And click OK. The next thing we're going to do is import the fault trace on the surface. This is under the shape of a GIS line. We're going to right click on the GIS data maps and photo folders in the project tree and select Import Vector Data. The shapefile is called Fault Line, so we can open it. This shapefile has no fields and is pretty simple, so we can just import it by clicking OK. The shapefiles appear under the GIS data, but there's also a version of it into the Drape GIS object below the topography, and this is the one we're going to drag into the scene. This fault has a limited extent, which is the reason why we call it a finite fault. Next, we are going to import some structural data for the fault. By right-clicking on the Structural Modeling folder, select Import Planner Structural Data, and look for the file called Fault Structure. It's a CSV file that contains three structural data with the dip and the azimuth. And click Finish to import them. They will appear under the Structural Modeling folder, and you can drag it into the scene. Make the radius a bit larger if you want to see them. We can see here those three red disks indicating the dip of the fault. This will be useful when we build our geological model. 
For now, we're going to remove the fault and the circular data. We can now start building our geological model. For this, right-click on the Geological Models folder and select New Geological Model. By default, the extent of the model is based on the elevation grid extent. The base lithology selected is set correctly to lithology. We're going to set a resolution of 100 meters, rename the geological model, and click OK. Once it's done processing, we can, for example, drag in the boundary to look at the volume in which we're going to build our model. I'm going to remove it now and also remove the topography. The next thing we're going to have to do is to create the surfaces. Here we have only two lithologies, the sediments and the volcanics. So there's going to be only one surface that separates them here. For this, we're going to right-click on the surface chronology and we're going to create a new deposit using the base lithology. Our primary lithology here is going to be the sediments and we're going to use the contact below. And we see here that there are nine contacts below with the volcanics. So now we can click OK to create the surface. Once it's done processing, we can also drag it into the scene. And we can see here the surface that was built. We are going to change right now some of the parameters in the surface properties. And in particular in the surfacing, we're going to activate the snapped data to all the data so that it snaps to the well data as well as to every polyline we're going to draw. The next thing to do is to create the fault. So remember we imported earlier this uh, fault line on surface. So we're going to right click in the fault system and create a new fault using GIS vector data. In this uh, window, we're going to select our fault line on topography and click OK. After the processing, we can look at the fault in the 3D scene, which is currently vertical. So we're going to add the structural data and make sure we select the fault structural data. Click OK. The fault will update and now we can see that it is dipping. For the next step, we're going to build the fault offset. So I can drag in my structural disk and I also make sure that my AGS line for the fault on surface is also visible. We can see the surface extent from the fault and realize that in the northeast as well as in the southeast, the fault is not present. So we will have to cancel any offset in these regions. The easiest way to do this is to use polylines. So I can right click on my surface and I'm going to edit using polyline. I can see that in the toolbar and I have my drawing tools. So I'm going to look at the model from above and I'm also going to make the fault line on surface in red to see it better and make it thicker. So now we can see the boundaries of the fault. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to use my uh, slicer to draw a new slice right at the bottom of the fault. I'll remove the other side and I will change the view in order to look directly in the direction of the fault. By drawing polylines that extend from both sides of the fault, I make sure that once I activate this fault, no offset will be created in these areas. So I'm going to create a first one. I'm going to move the slicer toward myself. And I'm going to create a few more polylines. It is important to draw enough polyline to connect the surface. So here I'm going to do four or five of them until I reach the boundary of my model. So we can see here the five polylines I just drew. Now we're going to have to do the same thing in the other side of the fault. So I'm going to look from above and I'm going to do a slice right by the fault line. Change the slice aside. I'll go right after the end of the fault and I'm going to look in the direction of the fault and do the exact same process of drawing polylines that go from one side to the other of the fault. So I use my drawing tool on the slicer and I go from the left side to the right side and I can do several of them like this. It's better to try to keep them separated by the same distance all the way to the boundary of the surface. As we can see now, we also have five polylines on the northeast side of the fault. The polyline, the first polyline is right at the beginning of my fault GIS line on surface. Before activating the fault, we're going to make sure that this polyline is being shared 
so that once we work in different blocks, we can still edit it. And also, we make sure to save the changes we made to the polylines. Before activating the fault, we're going to go into the surface and check the boundary filter. Right now it is on drilling only. And if I go into the input tab, I see that the boundary filter is applied on the drilling data, but is not applied on the lines, which is what I want. So we can click OK. And now we're going to go into our fault system and activate the fault. The model will reprocess and create two different blocks. So we're going to have to drag the surface from the block number two because we can only see the one from the block number one. If I hide my fault, I can see the offset that I created in the middle of the model. And I can also manually edit this offset. If I look at this surface here, this is in block number two. So I go in block number two and I'm going to edit with a new polyline. I look from above and I'm going to do a slice in the middle of my fault. And by looking on the side here, I can use my drawing tool, make sure I'm drawing on the slicer, and I'm just going to draw a line where I want my surface to go. When I save, this is going to modify the offset of my fault. As you can see when I remove the slicer and look from the side, the offset now is much bigger than it was before. We have now completed the first step of this workflow, because if I drag my fault into the scene, I can see that it still extends through the whole model. First, we're going to right-click on the fault and extract the vertices. This will go into the point folder, as you can see it here. Now I can go into my meshes folder, right-click, and I'm going to create a new mesh from points. The advantage of creating a new mesh is that I will be able to define its extent. First, I need to make sure I'm using the right points, so I select my fault line vertices and I would click on On Extents so that I can modify the extent of the fault. I'm also looking from above and I'm going to use the red arrows to change the extent of my fault to match the line that I have on surface. When this is done, I can change the resolution. I'm going to leave it to 100 here and click OK. After being processed, the fault is going to appear under my meshes folder and I can drag it into the scene. I see that my fault doesn't extend anymore all across the model. However, it is not being cut by the topography. To do that, I'm going to right-click on the meshes, go to Mesh Operations, and select Clip Mesh. The mesh we're going to clip is our fault line created from the vertices, and we're going to cut it with the topography. We're going to keep the outside, and make sure we include the overlap, which is the line of the fault on topography. We can also rename it to something simpler, like fault and finite, and click OK. The fault is being reprocessed and will also appear in the meshes folder. I'm going to clean a bit my scene so that we can see it better. And here we see our fault that's being clipped by the topography with a limited extent corresponding to the fault line. If we give it some transparency, we can see the offset of the fault across. We're not going to clear the scene and we're going to create from those surfaces our volumes. I'm going to put the wells into the scene. And now I have to do it in each of the block. So the first block, I open the surface chronology and I activate my surface. I also have to do it in the second block. I activate my surface. Leapfrog will process the surfaces to create two volumes. At the base, we have the volcanics where we can see our finite fault and its offset. I'm going to change the color to see it better. And above the volcanics, we're going to find the sediments. We're also going to check the offset by going on the slicer. So I'm going to cut a slice in the corner, look at the model from a section point of view, and move through the model. There is no offset at the beginning. In the middle, I can see the offset of our finite fault. And when I move further through the model, when the fault finishes, then the offset disappears. I'm going to unslice my volcanics, and I can see here my fault offset. This is the end of this video on how to create a final fault in your geological model.
I hope that the tools and techniques shown today will be useful for you and your bodening projects. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to contact us at support.energy.sequent.com.